Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Welcome back to WT FFF and our special series sponsored by HP. I'm Tom Hazard, along with Tracy. And Tracy, who are we going to speak with today? So we've got Mike Shannon from Hewlett Packard, and we're really this is a really an episode we decided to drop in, and we dropped it in early because we wanted to have it be because it's timely and relevant because this is a COVID nineteen special episode that we're doing, and we we added it to the collection of episodes because we really felt that it was so necessary to cover some of the details about what's going on right now of a ha- of of some of the things that only a company of only the size of HP could be accomplishing. So that's what you're going to hear is um, Mike Shannon is in charge of some of the initiatives that are going on um, and leading the supply chain efforts for the COVID-19 initiatives as well. So those are some really important things that we're going to cover here. But he's had 28 years with HP, mostly in the supply chain side. His education is in polymer technology and metals manufacturing management. And he's worked in plastic injection molding as well as in various aspects of the Hewlett Packard through the... Uh, through the hardware business, through global operations, through printer development programs, for, through I mean, mono to a color printer. So he's had c- quite the broad experience here. And then he transitioned to the supply chain business, supply chain side and working in ink commodities and technical teams. And all of that, it just culminated into where he's now back into the hardware business and he's leading the 3D multi-jet fusion supply chain strategy for the 3D color printer. And we're going to hear about some of the complexities of supply chain, as I mentioned before. Um, And he's helped to build the 3D supply base in North America and Asia. And, uh, you know, this is just uh, like the supply chain and COVID are so tightly woven together. They are. And you're going to hear the the one thing I think you're going to really enjoy is you're going to hear some, you know, real world uh, examples of how 3D printing has been used in in helping meet the demand in different parts around the world for what COVID-19 has has really presented as serious needs. So let's hear from Mike Shannon. Hey everyone, I'm coming from my home office talking to Mike Shannon in his home office. So like, you know, we're, we're really having this kind of uh, interesting times as they say, right, Mike? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, these interesting times being sheltering at home, being sequestered with COVID-19 going rampant, there's a lot of really great acceleration though. The positive opportunity has been happening on the 3D print side, the material side, all kinds of things. So, you know, what do you see as one of the most exciting accelerations and opportunities for helping right now? You know, I I think the biggest opportunity here is an awareness, right? That 3D's capability can respond really rapidly and we've been able to test that right through the the prototyping phases through various COVID type projects that we've been working on so we've taken designs and you hear about this all the time you hear how 3d you could do something in three or four days design and get the market but we've actually done that in about seven days we went from our customers actually went from design concept into production so uh, i think that's been a huge awareness uh, or just kind of um, reinforcement right of what 3d is supposed to be able to do uh, to be able to see it and now others i think are being able to ex- uh, to experience that beyond maybe some of the smaller little uh, pockets of people that do this on a regular basis yeah you know i think that the the rapid response is what we always hoped like we always wanted 3d printing to be able to do and it wasn't always it didn't always have that um that opportunity that that space where it could get the visibility for what it's great at Right. Um, so we are seeing that now and it's an, you know, unfortunate, but fortunate side effect at the same time. So what, uh, what kind of actions are you finding in, but that HP is taking that your clients and, and customers are taking to help healthcare workers and communities cope? Oh, uh, great question. I mean, it is, it's, you know, it's a global pandemic and it's a global solution. Um, and that's been, you know, if, if there's a positive side of this whole thing that, you know, for me, that's the encouraging piece everybody's rolling up their sleeves. Um, it doesn't matter what country, what university, what business you're in, people are all trying to be able to, to support. 
Um, HP specifically, we're working on a number of COVID projects where we're making face shields that we're donating, as well as we're helping our customers uh, get to market with their solutions, their designs. Uh, we're helping to be able to put supply chains, value chains together, um, not just the uh, MJF or the 3D printed aspect of it, our technology with our customers, but we're also going in and helping to be able to find suppliers that need other subcomponents that may go into an assembly. And then the value chain even further up, trying to, you know, because now it's a complex world where you have to get things through um, uh, FDA and certifications. And not all of our customers have those kinds of links and experiences. And so we're connecting and reaching out to medical device manufacturers. Um, and we're reaching out to medical distributors so that we're building those value chains to connect to get this product to market. It's one thing to be able to design it really quick. It's another thing to be able to figure out how you get it to the customers and in their hands. And so we've got a big network of people that are that are helping to be able to do that. You know, I just love that that you that the breadth of customer base that you have allows you to just touch so many people at once. And so um, and so it's very easy to start making those connection points. And even though you're such a big company at HP, the collaboration and connections are so high between all your departments and how everybody rallies together. Is that a uh, an uncommon thing or is it just happening right now or is that common all the time? Well, good question. HP, you know, traditionally is very collaborative, right? We, we learned a long time ago from the procurement supply chain perspective that you really need to have partners in collaboration with design and you need partners in collaboration with manufacturing, right? So we've always worn in the procurement world, supply chain world, these multiple hats where we represent the suppliers and to the people that are making the parts on the line, and we represent the suppliers and the folks on the line um, when they're designing parts in R&D. And so we're very facilitative in our role, um, but it's our culture as well where we do this, this uh, collaboration. So there's a mutual respect for everybody's roles that, uh, that they have to play from design production to sourcing. Um, and we've been able to work kind of in concert. Now that kind of rules out to this global pandemic, right, where um, that's a second nature to us is to bring parties together. And I think that's been a value add that, uh, that we've been able to, to bring to the, the solution to our customer base. So Mike, it seems that with this pandemic, the volume of the need has really spiked in certain cities at different times or certain countries. And has 3D printing from your perspective been able to keep up with that quantity demand yeah so two two pieces that, that come to mind when you when you talk about the quantity demand that the, the rapid response so maybe I'll, I'll go to the rapid response real quickly and touch on the, the quantity uh, a lesson that i've learned and we, we kind of opened up with this is that uh, 3d printing is fast right we, we know that in, in three to four or five days you know you can be you can have a product ready for market the, the piece that i'm also learning as i was talking about developing the value chains and the supply chain and the connections that doesn't always move as fast as the technology, right? So now you have a situation where you can move really rapidly, but you have to be planning with that endpoint in mind. How do you bring that supply chain together so it's ready in seven days to be able to go to market? And that's been a bit of a challenge, right? Um, uh, but, you know, and equally in those different commodities, we're working with die cut manufacturing to be able to provide clear PET shields to our 3D printed uh, frames that our customers are making. In that environment, they have prototype solutions, fast turn solutions as well. They've matured. And so we've been able to tie into those. But some of those manual, hey, how do you process a PO to be able to get it to the website, to be able to make sure that the supply comes in, that everything can go out the door in time, all of that still has to be done. And there's tools, mm -hmm. of course, that, that advance that, but it's uh, still a, a bit drawn out. Yeah. You were going to go on the other side. Yeah, I was like, yeah. please touch on the... <laughs> so on, the on the quantity side, um, uh, there's a place for 3D printing. And then there's a place for injection molding, which is typically where we, we uh, kind of have a balance. Um, and right now, uh, even if these volumes would dictate that you would be in injection molding, we're just unsure. The, the world is unsure. We don't know if this, this COVID thing goes away tomorrow. It goes away in six months, a year. We're trying to read and figure out. All businesses are trying to read and figure out so they can figure out how to position their investments and what kind of investments to make to be able to put in solutions. And so 3D printing comes in um, very economically, very quickly, uh, and, and potentially it becomes a bridging solution to get to those higher volumes that potentially may, may be required. 
Um, and I but, like the idea of the, also the bridging solution that also allows you to make more design refinement because we are learning new things every single day about how to fight the disease or how our equipment needs to operate or what we really need to protect ourselves. And, you know, that that's also, I think that flexibility is important too. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, and that's been pivotal too in this whole development process. Again, the speed at which we can, we can iterate um, goes back to your conversations about the collaboration, getting the feedback and having everybody together so that we can make those, those connections and response. Really well, and the amount of time it would take to make an injection mold tool to respond. I mean, you, you would be best case scenario. I mean, a month, six weeks down the road, if you really rushed it. And, and then, you knew it was right. <laughs> and you're stuck, right. Yeah. I mean, you're not right. going to make many, you're not going to iterate with that. So you really want to make sure that it's, it's right. Yeah, and it works. So you, you, you um, along with other members of the HP team, had a webinar that was sponsored about COVID-19 containment, applications, like a, a lot of other things. What was the, what was the webinar called? Uh, I, I think it was just how 3D um, 3D manufacturing processes are supporting the supply chain. Um, right. It was about 3D manufacturing. That was the that was the word I was missing in my title here. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it was so interesting because I I also thought start, started to think that the conversation really heads into a lot of what you were just mentioning that the understanding of bridge production, and we've been using that for quite some time, but it's it hasn't been as publicly understood. To the criticalness of actually having the ability to, to have a big bridge production model. Right. No, it, it goes back to your, your questions. How does all this stuff feed together? And, you know, we, I talk about this all the time with my suppliers, with our customers, the, the key in when you move into a new product development is you have to think far enough down the road to understand. I always start to talk about think with the endpoint, start with the endpoint in mind. And if you can do that, then you can plan back through the life cycle of the product to be able to make sure you're using the right solutions. So bridging for us typically means that we're using uh, our, our technology for 3D printing in the early stages of life cycle where we're stabilizing the designs, going through multiple iterations, more cost effectively because we're not building you know, steel tools and, uh, and the slower uh, iteration process that takes. Uh, as you go up the curve, you, you end up move it into injection molding and hopefully it's stable and you don't have any issues down the road. You know, I think the other part of it that intrigues me so much is that is that we're having such a disruption in, in supply chain. And I think people don't really understand the complexity of supply chain and sometimes the complexity within a product. And you guys understand that to, I think, the nth degree. You know, your printer is inherently supply chain complex with all the different parts and pieces. Could tell us a little bit about that. Oh, well, um, yeah. well, if you just go to our color printer that we're working on, on the plastic side uh, of it, so injection molded pieces and, and uh, 3D printed pieces, I think there's there was close to 800 uh, parts, plastic parts that went into the machine. And now I think it's back down closer to 600 because a lot of those get obsolete like we were talking about, right? Um, and so that's that's a very complex um, operation. But beyond that, there's probably another 30 or 40 commodities, right, that are going into that, that piece of equipment. Probably not at that level of volume because plastics usually makes a big piece, but then you get sheet metals and, and elastomeric pieces, die cut pieces. So all of those are very complex. And when you get a disruption like COVID worldwide, oh my gosh, it just throws you know, chaos into the manufacturing arena, trying to figure out how do you get alternative sources of supply um, in order to be able to do that, you have to understand all the commodity supply chains and having backup redundant solutions in place to be able to respond in, in a time like this. Well, you know, and this is the thing. It's like we very often, when we think of supply chain, we instantly think of China, which isn't the only disruption because I saw a report on the news the other day about the the little vials that they put, um, yeah. uh, uh, you know, um, immunizations yeah. in, you know, and, and the chem and drugs and other medicines come from Italy that the glass yep. is made in Italy. So with them having their own issues, we're having supply chain problems there. We, we in the U.S. obviously know that we're having a, a supply chain problem in, in meats and other areas. So we, we don't really grasp the globalness of this. It does, it's not just a China problem. It's a worldwide oh. problem. Yeah, no, you're, you're very insightful. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're living that every day. And that goes into my thinking today currently, right? So when I'm setting up a supply chain or this value chain as we go up into the medical manufacturers, um, we realize that um, it's great if you have this 3D printed swab, 
um, but you also need to make sure that you have the vials for the kit, right? And the, the reagents that go into it and the, and the sterilization and the packaging and all those pieces. And so if you can, um, in this, in this uh, world where you can't get all those sources of supply worldwide, you need to be able to look internally and find those sources of supply that can make the reagents that have uh, medical grade injection molding facilities to be able to make the tubes and the caps and have those capabilities and where they don't, we work together to be able to try to get that so it's vertically integrated so we don't have those dependencies right now, which is so critical to get this product to, the product to market. Yeah, and you know, but it, it's not always feasible and realistic to no. go vertical, right? You know, you know that when you're starting up a new product, it's not feasible to go vertical. Very many times, you know, we even do our product design in multiple stages. One where we start with off-the-shelf parts completely, and then just do a, you know, whatever the design modification that we want to test out the market value on. Then we might move to okay, now we're going to make more of it special, more of it unique, and then eventually maybe we might go completely vertical on, you know, by the third third round of it. But all along we're actually selling and testing the product. So, yeah. you know, it's just depending on the product life cycle, even a big brand does that same process. A small brand doesn't have the option because pricing is usually a factor. So finding something off the shelf can be, you know, going vertical can be very expensive if, if you're yeah. not in the right business. Yeah, we, we kind of refer to that as, as turnkey and guided turnkey solutions within our operations within supply chain. And so um, our turnkey solutions are those that we buy off the shelf. And then we've got you know thousands of those pieces that go into that complex pieces of equipment, the 3D printer that we're talking about. And then we've got the more customized solutions that we have that we call guided turnkey, where we have the subject matter expertise and then we work directly with our, our supply chain that we pick. And then as we transition it, as you were talking about, um, where we've developed it locally for our, our local uh, prototype lines as we go into production then we transition it over to some of them over to uh, turnkey uh, and then we allow the contract manufacturers to pick their own source of supply within their region um, to get the best you know, the best deals and so yeah there's definitely a, a life cycle of that as well <laughs> you know I, I just think of that there's got to be some great stories and, and client and customers of yours that are doing some interesting things that are real world examples Let, let's talk a little bit about that tell us some of the applications that you've been seeing uh, from a COVID perspective, yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, the one that I've been really, uh, a couple of them that I've been working on is the uh, the face shields. Uh, and so, you, you know what that looks like, right? So there was uh, anything in the PPP, uh, PPE world um, has been in short supply, I've been rapidly trying to be able to uh, um, fill that need as quickly as we can. And we've been able to do that, right, with this collaborative environment, putting this, this value chain together to be able to respond. Uh, with different players, I mean, small businesses, larger corporations that are, have global footprint and the little guys that are doing maybe the 3D printing. Um, it's been fabulous uh, and fun to be able to put that together. Uh, working with a number of universities, right? Um, Yale at one particular point here has been working on some development applications that are splitter related uh, to uh, the ventilations, uh, the vent, uh, vent the ventilators, uh, trying to come up with some leading uh, technologies on how to be able to um, split the ventilation so that you can have two patients or three patients on, on one machine. So some experiments. It's kind of interesting because if you do any reading around splitters, that, that doctors are saying that, you know, what a crazy concept that would be in a time when you don't need them, right? And, and you know, there's been some, you know, exploratory, you know, uh, research projects done. And everybody just kind of pushed those to the side, but then all of a sudden you get a global pandemic and those aren't here. And all of a sudden what was crazy then is very, very important now. And so now they're dusting those things off and, and realizing that there is a value proposition there. And then well, just and the, I also think that in some of those examples of things like, you know, replacement parts or as you say, like diverters or, or, or splitters and that type of thing is that, you know, if we, it, in recognition of that, if we're not really great as a manufacturer of a product, if we're making a ventilator or we're making anything, we don't have the assets of the digital design of all of the different pieces and parts. We can't be as flexibly responsive. And that is now also something I think that's come to the forefront of thinking is that it is our responsibility uh, uh, as those that make a uh, product to make sure that all of those assets and all of those things are are in a repository, can be shared and willingly shared because we've heard of some stories of them not being willingly shared. Um, and so, you know, being, being at that place where that can happen, because so many times we know when we design products, you know, by the time it gets manufactured, the drawings don't even match anymore. Right. And in this environment, right, a lot of stuff's going out without drawings, right? Because yeah. we're, we're moving really, really rapidly. 
and you, drawn, you still have to have them, but you're catching up. And in, in my normal world, in my life cycle, working at HP, you never would release a product without a print, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, <laughs> Yeah, I'm here to tell you, like, some of that's happened pretty quickly, so. Well, and. Like, we do what we got to do, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Now we do, yeah. yeah. Well, certainly, to respond quickly, you do. You know, it, it, it strikes me, you know, I've, I've had experience with engineers in other countries, in particular Europe, countries like France and Germany, and uh, those cultures, I think, must really be wrestling with this need to put things <laughs> out quickly, because they tend to engineer and engineer and engineer and really not put anything out until it, they think it's perfect. I, I don't think they inherently embrace iteration the way that we do in the United States. Have you experienced any of that? Oh, it's hard for me to be able to say culture to culture because for every culture you can say um, that likes to, you know, not, you know, iterate and iterate, I can give you four or five, you know, uh, different examples, even within my own company, right, where we have those kinds of challenges. I think that's an engineering phenomenon right it's a like it, <laughs> it's it, an engineering mindset that has to shift it, it, it sure. is it's, it's a dna right we're, we're wearing a tool belt and we're trying to get the best product out and I, I think that transcends all different you know kinds of cultures but the, i think the thing that's you know kind of interesting is that um every once in a while it's good to stress your systems right it's good to stress uh, and actually break your systems you know and a lot of times i have this little mantra that i, I share with my suppliers um, it's important to be able to stress, break, so you can innovate. And if you don't have that DNA and that formula in your organization, you end up stressing and breaking things and losing money and going out of business, right? But it's the companies that, <clears throat> that understand how to be able to respond rapidly, and they can see where sources of variation are drifting into the manufacturing operation, and they can respond to it because they have those triggers, right? They're paying attention to it and then they can iterate. So when you come to a time of crisis like this, um, those are the companies that are able to accelerate, they're able to go really quickly, whether they're you know, uh, not related to cultures anywhere in the world, um, it's that, that formula you know, uh, remains the same. Well, I think that the opportunity to help is greater so that our yeah. desire as human beings to be helpful, we will we will inherently get frustrated if there's a bureaucratic system in the process of it, a paperwork trail, as you were talking about POs and other things getting right. in our way. And we'll say, there's got to be a better way. Let's be ingenious about this and let's, you know, use good old American ingenuity or what, you know, European ingenuity, whatever it might be. Yeah. And let's fix this system, right? Yeah, yeah you're, you're spot on. And I think that's just what excites me, excites everybody, right? Is that when everybody has the same vision and the same passion um, with a common goal, you can move mountains, right? And I think that's really what's happening right now. People, people feel connected, and and you know, honestly, having governments to be able to help, to be able to remove the roadblocks, to be able to put emergency use authorizations in place, to be able to get this innovation bubbling, I think is a lesson for a lot of people to be able to learn there. When you take the handcuffs off, I think creativity and innovation, you know, really flourishes. You have to do that within you know processes and make sure that we're safe. Um, but I'm seeing I'm seeing innovation, you know, daily here. Uh, every every time we're engaging, because you move so fast, you come up with a lot of problems, a lot of challenges. But when you get the right mix of people, you're able to break through those. Especially if you have the right mix of people without those constraints that typically would hold you down, where you're saying, ah, you know, but that'll take you know six months to be able to get it through the regulatory uh, process or what have you. So yeah, I think. I think in this environment, if you've got the right, you know, like I say, DNA and culture within your own business. You know, I, uh, the last thing that I was thinking about was the the idea that localized manufacturing, right, being able to then distribute out. And this was always a real problem for us early on when we had been thinking about having uh, a 3D design business where we would just design and then they could be locally printed around the world is that there wasn't a consistency and a quality, but I think that 3D printing and especially with your products at HP, they've come to a level of consistent and, and quality output that you can feel fairly confident that, you know, whether you're in New York or Los Angeles or, you know, Rome, Italy, you know, it, you'll be able to print the same part for the same, uh, you know, replacement part for a piece of equipment. Yeah, that's just huge for us right now. And and you know, my background's pretty pretty deep and pretty broad as far as global development and, and developing supply chains and working with suppliers all around the world. Um, and I can't tell you how refreshing it was to be able to work on the 
um, our color printer, which was one of the, the on the supply chain side that I was uh, helping to champion for the 3D printing, putting our own parts in our own machine. That's also another kind of weird concept, but <laughs> um, but to be able to not have to be on the phone at 11 o'clock at night uh, or at five or six o'clock in the morning talking to uh, operations around the world. Um, that I'm on the same time zone with West Coast uh, um, suppliers to us with our technology and then having to talk to them and having line of sight in the very beginning to be able to say, we'll do the development with you, but you've got to be able to get this over into Asia where we're going to be building it. And so aligning with those folks makes it really easy to be able to make the transition. So one of our suppliers in the Bay Area, we started out with uh, through the MPI, the, the product development cycles. And then they actually moved their operation or started to move it. They left it there, but they offered to open up another one in the basement of the, of the uh, contract manufacturing operation. That'd be one of the same. And so they just moved everything to their basement uh, in Asia. And that was fantastic. And it was just turned because they literally took the files uh, or the processes of the, of the designs and turned them on in the same equipment in the basement and talk about flexibility, talk about, you know, tying the market, talk about not having to get through customs. You know, at the same time, I've got <laughs> other, other product coming in. Uh, at the same time from, from North America, they're coming in, the boxes are all beat up and there's holes in them and parts are being, you know, broken. And in fact, that's my, my biggest issue right now uh, is getting parts to the facility without them breaking because of the transit, you know, uh, impact. And these folks are down in the basement and they're not even putting them in boxes. They're putting them on a rack rolling the rack into their elevator, pushing the button, and there they deliver them to the floor. Um, so that is the kind of the epitome of, of this uh, you know, uh, opportunity that we have in the digital uh, world. And then likewise. Yeah, I couldn't have imagined it, you know, four or five years ago, to be honest with you, which is the technology just wasn't there. I mean, we recognize that from our own, from our own desire for what we wanted to do, that it just wasn't the, the consistency, the quality, the ability wasn't there. Um, and now it is. And that, I think, is the biggest excitement for me is that the ecosystem, the structure and foundation is so in place that we really can all build off of that. And it's funny because it, it, it reminds me, right, that our, my suppliers, who are also my customers or HP's customers, right, the buyer technology, it's hard for them to also get their head wrapped around this. So traditionally, if you have injection molding, right, and, uh, and I have deep background in injection molding, and there's a problem they usually try to hide that from the customer as long as they possibly can, right? So they're trying to fix it. They don't want to look bad. Um, the, the, but then they're stressing us out because now all of a sudden we get that call in the 11th hour, ah, the, the, the tool broke down or the machine broke down. And uh, you still have that mindset, right? Even in 3D printing, it's just normal. Um, and I'm trying to break those barriers down to be able to say, hey, look, take the pressure off of you. Right, because in injection molding, if I needed to say your machine was down and we were we were hurting, we'd have to physically move that steel tool to another customer, and it could be in a different state, country, whatever, to be able to keep operations going. Now I talk to him, I say, let's have better transparency here. Don't worry, because I get manufacturing, that's in my DNA. Um, we've been doing it so long, Murphy's Law always prevails, right? So you're gonna have hiccups. So let me know because now I can get you some cover time. I can get you three days, five days, seven days, because now I can pick up the phone and send the files over to another uh, uh, supplier of ours and literally turn it from one day or an hour from one place to the next and turn it on while they're getting their, their factory and operation back and going. The trust factor that they have to have is that they haven't lost the business from me, that we've right. got this ability to be able to move it between a network of HP customers. Very, very powerful, right? And so they're learning that and they're trusting me right now at this point. But initially they were trying to do the same thing, pull, pull back and not share. Now you take pressure off of them. They're not panicking. They know they get the business and, and, and they get to do it in return for other folks that, that have those kinds of issues as well. Well, and you can start to spawn collaboration between each one of them so that they can cover each other. So they, you don't even have to, you won't even know. It's just all working for you. And, and, and that's happening, especially through our COVID business right now. Um, we've got, uh, say, like face shields. We, we get orders for hundreds of thousands. Now we, the, the, the network, our, our HP customers uh, get, get orders for hundreds of thousands of these, and they can't produce them all. And so they're right. able to work through the network, transferring common files and following the common processes to be able to deliver. So it's a much more power. You can't do that very easily in the Jackson Molding, right? You'd have to have tools in every one of these facilities to be able to to make something like that happen. So these are the things that are working their way 
you know, uh, because of COVID and, and testing some of these concepts that everybody knew uh, you could do, but now we're really, you know, putting some, uh, some product through it. I wish that the, the infrastructure around the world for, you know, testing uh, could be 3D printed and it, it can't, obviously, it's more involved with chemistry and other things, but, right, right. Um, but if they, if we could, we'd, we'd, we'd be a we'd lot be better right off that. in this world, but you know, at least that in uh, these other ways, we have ways now to just turn it on yeah. um, as much as needed. Or I also was thinking you probably could have a situation where, you know, you may need to manufacture something so quickly that has multiple different kinds of parts and maybe just capacity and throughput on machine. You're going to have one supplier making one part or a certain set of parts and another making another set of parts mm -hmm. and then bring them all together. Yeah, yeah. And that's a, a little bit what we're, we're doing right now with face shields and even with swabs, right? So we're, we're working on 3D printed swabs and you know the volumes, you know the numbers. They're, they're, they're huge and the demand and what have you. And so it's a lot for just one uh, of our customers to be able to keep up with that. So that network capability and, uh, and knowing that we've got the repeatability, you know, within our equipment, we've got the design that's stable, you know, that we can, we can set up that really puts you in a, in a good spot to be able to respond. And to me, this is new because I, I like I said, I come out of the injection molding arena. And, uh, and so it's kind of fun to be able to realize you can think in a different space, a digital space, right? Mike, do you have any advice for um, the 3D designers and the 3D printers out there who are listening to this show um, and for the businesses that are out there? What is the biggest opportunity for them? How can they look at the world differently and look at it as an opportunity instead of a crisis? So, like I said, you know, earlier, I, I really like the idea of talking about stressing systems right? Breaking systems so you can innovate. Um, that's a, a positive outlook on a negative situation, right? Um, if you can find uh, um, positivity, right, in this horrible, you know, time, it's helping to be able to highlight, you know, the gaps, the needs, the inefficiencies. Um, <laughs> I read an article the other day, I shared this with somebody that thought it was pretty funny, like I did. Um, it, there was a reference to the learnings about COVID and uh, being prepared in, in the medical industry and our governments around the world. So this is just you know, one impact. And, and they quoted Alan Greenspan. And Alan Greenspan said, um, when, when the tide goes out, you can find out who's uh, been swimming without a bathing suit. Right. <laughs> so, You're right. A little bit funny. <laughs> Shocking from Alan Greenspan. Yes. <laughs> but the whole idea it comes back to that stress, you know, and innovate. If if while the tides are high, it's like just in time inventory, right? While the while the tides are high, you can hide a lot of inefficiencies. But when the tide goes down, uh, like in, uh, your inventory doesn't uh, fill uh, your line, right? It exposes the the weaknesses in systems and processes, and the winners, right, in business are the ones that embrace that, right, that see that as the, the gold nugget, nugget in the pan. I'm not throwing that nugget down the stream. They're going to take come back and they have that DNA to be able to say, how do I put in operations and systems to be able to identify and reduce and, and remove sources of variation? And when they see it, they respond to it. Um, versus early in my career, I was in an injection molding company <clears throat> who actually went bankrupt. They had big growths. You know, they were stressing and breaking systems, but the way they were solving problems is they weren't innovating. They were throwing people at problems, right? And so I, I think I think being able to develop that culture and then using 3D printing technology to be able to be one of the tools in your tool belt to be able to solve those problems. And one of the things that we do. Uh, we have over 300, uh, um, we had, we peaked out around 300 uh, MJF parts, 3D uh, parts in our color printer. And one of the things that we watched our quality grow, because uh, you have to remember, this is uh, brand new technology, never used before, and I think it's probably the world's largest application of using 3D printed parts. And we had uh, a number of issues for quality uh, on, uh, at our suppliers as well as on our lines. And what we ended up doing in very early stages of development is that we would sit down with our suppliers every single month and we would have them stack all of their rejects on a table in front of us. And we would take a look at those rejects and damaged parts and we would use those as opportunity. They were, that was the golden nuggets, right? They were on the table in front of us. 
And we then iterated design solutions around all those. And we designed and redesigned and redesigned these parts every single month. 3D capability to be able to make that is cost effective and you get the turn really quickly. And so we got this cycle going with our R&D partners and with our suppliers and we were, and with our manufacturers, our contract manufacturer, solving these problems. And over the course of about six months, we watched our quality jump up to about 90, 92% good parts. And over the next three months, we watched it get up to about 97, 98%. And currently we're running about 99 point, I think 4% good parts that are up on the lines. And that's and a, test, a testament to- I can tell you that that's like a really hard thing to do with that many parts in a product. <laughs> so. and, and it's just, but it, again, it's working with really good suppliers, right? To have and share the same kind of vision, the same kind of processes and they get it uh, on how to be able to kind of put these pieces together. But the value of 3D allows you to be able to do that if you have the umbrella of that DNA on how to be able to um, identify, you know, sources of manufacturing um, inefficiencies. Well, Mike, I thank you so much for sharing um, what's been going on and for keeping on top of this and for being a part of solutions around the world. So thank you, Mike, for your participation. Appreciate it. It was a good opportunity. So thanks for, thanks for having me. Tom, you know, uh, that, the last bit of advice that he was giving about being, you know, a positive and have a positive outlook. I want to add just one little thing that we gave advice to our clients about this past week as well. And that is that when you approach something as this is a short term thing, we just got to get through it, just like push through it. When you look at that and you don't look at it as an opportunity, you don't look at it as an opportunity to make something that's more sustainable long term, then you don't actually make efficiency. So if we looked at our business, so we have our our podcast business, as we mentioned, we were onboarding a lot of new clients in the last few months, and it's stressing our system of being able to like take them efficiently through, make sure we're keeping up on them, monitoring their progress and all of those things. And so it's stressing our, our, what I call our customer service side of our system, right? And so if we didn't take that as an opportunity and we said, oh, this is just going to be short term. And then it, that's not realistic because look, wouldn't it be great if our business sustained at that new level? So, you know, thinking about that, that short-term thinking is also a problem. And so that crisis, when you stay in that negative crisis mode, then you stay in that short-term thinking. So moving into opportunity and innovation requires a sustainable long-term outlook. And that's uh, one of the ways that you can move from that. So I hope that, you know, that advice that Mike was giving and, and, and the, what we're saying right now is really helping move to that. But you've also had some great new uh, great little stories and other things you've been picking up and saving in the news to talk about. Sure. Well, I mean, and really they are about the short-term need and innovating around problems. And I, I agree with Mike completely in how he said that. And if you don't take that opportunity to innovate, you you can't help yourself for the long term. Well, so a couple of different stories that, you know, and if you haven't seen these in the news, we're going to have links in the blog post at 3dstarpoint.com for these. And some of them have videos that will also be there that you, you'll want to check out videos and images. But there's a, a company at a Billings, Montana, uh, a 3D print manufacturer who I didn't even you know, I hadn't even heard of them uh, before, but they're taking their 3D printers and are manufacturing face shields. Now, obviously you heard Mike talk about that, um, you know, HP is doing that as well. I mean, there just seems to be such HP a clients big, okay. HP clients, I'm sorry. Well, HP is facilitating their clients to make them. Um, so to actually uh, take these 3D printers that they have, that they're trying to sell the 3D printers, but in the meantime, meeting the need right now, for creating and manufacturing face shields. And it's the same thing, plastic type face shield, the 3D printing, the piece that goes on your head that the face shield, you know, goes on. And that's, you know, a very important thing uh, that they're doing to help, which is very impressive. And and they're working- And I wouldn't mind buying one of those 3D printers, but it's field tested, it did some good. And now, you know, that seems like a really viable thing. I don't think that would be, that's a great use of sitting inventory. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, this is uh, Budman Industries is the name of the company. And I really hadn't been aware of them as a 3D print manufacturer. Um, but then, you know, their manufacturing. Oh, but Isaac Budman, we did interview him. Did don't, we interview yes, him? Yes, we interviewed him because he wrote a book. Don't you remember? Mm, it's been 500 I know. Some I'm the reader in the, and I'm them. the reader in the group. Know. Yeah. So, but that, so that doesn't surprise me that Isaac would start up something like that. So. 
And actually, I'm I'm gonna correct myself. It wasn't actually Billings Montana 3D printing company. They're in, in upstate New York and Liverpool, but I guess the Billings Montana in this article has to do with um, a different group of 3D people with 3D printers making masks. So anyway, the, but the point is, as we've said, 3D printing is widely distributed and you have lots of people doing it. Well, you know, the one thing I wanted to say about face masks that I've been thinking in, and I've been hearing from a lot of people, and I know that you, this was, um, uh, our, our friend Dean Flood was mentioning how hard it was for them to get supplies to open. Um, what is, a, an, I'm going to call it an extended nursing care. So it was right. like a facility that his wife works for. And they can't open unless they have certain pieces of equipment of which they cannot obtain because they're all being diverted to hospitals. So unless you're an urgent care facility, you aren't allowed to get the PPE necessary or the personal protection equipment, just to redefine that for those of you who don't remember what that is. Um, and so they've been going to restaurant supply companies and they can only buy so much every single day. So they each go every day, like to try to, to buy enough to be able to reopen the facility. Um, and so when you think about that, what a great solution for you if you're in your community to help the hair salons and the, the smaller companies and the restaurants and the, those things that need to acquire the PPE, but not be not stress the hospital systems as well or not take it away from those that need it in the healthcare system because we need to protect those workers too. So what a great solution for it because it doesn't have to be FDA approved. Like you don't have to go through all of that, but it can be working and you don't have to deal with any issues, right? So, you know, being thinking about that, that's a way you could be really useful as a 3D printer. I agree with you there, Tracy. You know what? I'd like to share another really good story. This one's out of Italy. And of course, we all know Italy got hit tremendously hard, um, but with the coronavirus more so than many countries. And so hospitals in Italy were in desperate need of these valves that are used as a part of the IV process in order to give people fluids and medicines and actually feed them when they're, you know, in a coma and all this. And they were unable uh, to get a supply of the valves they needed. You know, the, the hospitals had reached out to, you know, the supplier of the actual valve and said, we need this many more now. And they said, well, I, I, we don't have them. We're sorry, we can't manufacture them that quickly. You would not get them for a long time. And so then they asked if they could get the actual CAD file of the parts so that they could have them made. And, and the company, my understanding is, did not agree to do that. Refused, yeah. So they reverse engineered them. They had some local people in Italy who had skills in 3D modeling and 3D printing, reverse engineer these parts and make them so that they could meet their needs for, for healthcare, for their citizens. And it's a fantastic example of, you know, innovating your way around a problem and meeting the need of, of your citizens to save lives. Unfortunately, there were some other stories that came out in, in, in this where the manufacturer apparently threatened to sue these people that reverse engineered it. And they're, you know, th that's an ongoing thing. And I have a link to the article in the blog post. So if you really want to know all the details about that, I mean, I, I think we have to approach this as a global community and realize, look, they wanted to buy these things from you if you can't supply them and they have another way to make these supplies one way or another that they need to save lives. I, I think we have to let that human safety and healing take place and, and, well, and it's not it happen. An, it's not a good brand strategy yeah, for you to be definitely. doing that. So I can't imagine that any court is going to be too favorable on that anyway. And now you've just damaged yourself in the public opinion. So that's not a smart move. And I'm always of the opinion that like IP um, is important, but not in the face of doing good. Well, right? not at the expense of saving lives. I mean, I think yeah. you, you can, you can carve out a very narrow exception that meets your company's need for, for value and protection, but not at the expense of people's lives. But anyway, that's, that's an isolated case, but a great, I still think a great example of 3d printing being used in a, in a wonderful way to help save lives. And then of course we, you know, may, many of you may have seen, and we'll have a link in the blog post to this as well. I've 3d printed and used this myself, but 
many of us have the kind of masks that you have uh, loops that go over your ears. Just the fabric ones. Fabric, yeah. Or there are even some medical made ones that have loops that go behind your ears. And for me, I wear glasses. These straps behind my ears are not very comfortable. And then, you know, they tend to pull your ears out and make you look a little, me anyway, I'll just speak about me, make me look a little bit like Dumbo or something. You know, <laughs> I've got my ears sticking out. And I don't really care for that. And it's also not very comfortable. You don't comfortable. have all the hair to hide it. You know, That's that true. Idea. But it's not very comfortable. So, you know, there's a very popular, and there are many different versions, but there are some popular items where you can 3D print in literally 20 minutes or at most or something to- it Uses uh, a very little amount of plastic. Print a very small amount of plastic that it's, it's thin enough that it's flexible and bends. You can make it pretty much out of any plastic. PLA I found worked great where it's this thing that goes behind your, your neck essentially and, and has different, um, it, it, it's adjustable because there's many different little hooks that can essentially hook on those pieces of the side of your mask, make so it we'll easier have, to wear and more comfortable. We'll have pictures in the blog post at, for this episode at 3dstartpoint.com and so you'll be able to see that um, and I'll, I'll try to take a picture of the back of your head for you. <laughs> so you don't have to selfie it yourself. Happen, yeah. But, yeah <laughs> I, I, you'll show how much hair I've lost. But, yeah. Well, and uh, you know, this is the thing is though, is that like sometimes though, like that's a 3D print solution. So everything, you know, when we have a hammer, we think everything's a nail. And so just because we have a 3D printer, we think we should 3D print everything. Of course, I see things through, sometimes through a textile lens. So I, my solution to the ear problem was get a headband with buttons and I put the, the loops on the buttons. So it's pretty low tech. So we'll have to show both of them out there. So yeah. mine is super low tech and it took about two seconds. But, but <laughs> that solutions have no interest to me because I'm not going to wear a headband no matter, even if you provided it to me or paid me to wear it. But and it's really soft and comfortable. Maybe it is, but it's also not a 3D print solution. So why are we talking about that? <laughs> well, I just, sometimes you don't need a 3D print solution for everything. It sounds great. And I, and I love that we have that capability of adding it into our repertoire, but sometimes we don't need something that we have to take time to engineer. I don't know about that. I think it's a 3D print solution for everything. <laughs> well, this, this is why we have the show, right? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, you know, I think that, you know, I, I am so grateful that, I uh, just want to say that to you, Tom, that I am so grateful that I actually get to shelter in place with my best friend. <laughs> so I'm really grateful that families are together right now, that ones that can be. And, you know, we, we, we wish the world recovery. We wish them good health. Um, and we, we all really desire to be a part of the solution. So looking at these things less as crises and as opportunities, I think that's the wisest thing that we can do right now. And our job, I believe that I was putting her on this earth, and I think that we were, you might agree with me, to create. Like that was what no. I, my gift to the world is that I have this creation no, ability. No question. Right. And my design thinking and my job is to apply that. So if that's where you are, if you're in the manufacturing world then manufacture, if you're a designer, then go design. If you want to do good in the world, use your core gift right now, because I think this is the time for you to shine and you to bring that out and to, to stop gap uh, a problem with a great um, opportunity for innovation. I agree. I mean, clearly this is a horrible global health crisis that, you know, once in a century type of thing, and it is terribly tragic, but I think we can all contribute in some way using whatever our gifts are. And I think that's a great, great thing that, that we can do and how we can contribute. And it's not that we're excited about the fact that there's this, global health crisis, but we do see the silver lining. Right? Well, and you know, we, we see it from all perspectives and I know that HP has seen it too, because when you watch their um, webinar, you'll understand where mm -hmm. all of the departments are saying, it's about time that we start to fix this part of the industry, or we start to fix this part of the supply chain, or we start to do these things because it, we now are seeing why it's a problem. We, we were just living with it before because complacency is just a little easier path, right? Fixing things and change is hard. So, but now we have to change. So when we look at all of that, that that's kind of where I am with it is that just thinking about the idea that there's been so many things wrong with the supply chain. There's been so many things wrong with retail, mm -hmm. right? You know, we recognize that. And there's so many things wrong in, in various parts of manufacturing and how other things work. And now's the opportunity to take the time to repair them, to fix them, to get our own business health back too, so that we can be 
more economically viable in this new economy that is emerging in the industry with the IE that we've been talking about throughout the series, um, that industry 4.0. And so um, that we will be talking throughout the series because this episode is airing early. So, so the webinar for, uh, that they ran um, that has multiple experts on it, not just Mike Shannon, um, but had multiple experts on it, some of whom you'll recognize from other episodes as you go forward in the series. Um, they are, that's going to be at 3dstartpoint.com. And you can also go to 3dstartpoint.com forward slash HP, where you'll have links to all of the various um, different resources and other tools that they provided for us um, to give to you. And so they'll all be in one place. You can just check that page as well, but you're not going to want to miss the blog post because there's pictures, there's videos, there's other things in there as well. So you definitely want to do that. And the last thing I want to say is that, you know, in the whole process that of what we've been doing here with HP, and I know this episode is airing early, but we actually recorded it pretty late because we let some time go by to make sure that um, we really understood wh what was happening with um, the response to COVID-19. I think there are very few companies that are poised to be as globally reactive and globally proactive in the process as HP. There are very few companies like that who can do that, who can be a part of the solution. And so HP being a part of the solution for global recovery, for um, COVID-19 recovery, and for economic recovery, I think is really high. And I'm grateful that they've, they've risen to the occasion. I am too. And I've also been very impressed how they view what they're doing, not only to further all those efforts you just mentioned, Tracy, but also to help advance the, the 3D printing industry as a whole, and not just for the sake of a HP. That's been impressive to me, is that they see themselves as part of a bigger solution. They have the the ability, the the wherewithal to be able to invest and help move things forward and in collaborate. a good way and collaborate, absolutely. Uh, that's been impressive to me. And I think you'll see that as you go forward in the remaining episodes in this series. So until the next one, uh, this has been Tracy and Tom on the WTFFF 3D Printing Podcast. Thanks for listening to the WTFFF special series brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP. You can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3D Startpoint and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D.